Hello and welcome to this ICTN special presentation as the Irving Heritage Society marks the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The group invited two speakers with insight like none other to share their memories of the day and the Irving connections. The biggest connection can be found in this South Irving home, which at the time belonged to Ruth Payne. Lee Harvey Oswald stayed here in 1963. Now the city of Irving is converting this home into a museum that recognizes its place in history. In this program, you will hear from Buell Frazier. In 1963, he was living with his sister on West 5th Street and gave Lee Harvey Oswald rides to and from work. His actions led to some shocking questions and accusations you will hear him describe. But first, Hugh Ainsworth. He has been a newsman for 65 years and was a witness to some of the events on November 22, 1963. The multi-Pulitzer Prize nominee wrote JFK Breaking the News, and he begins this program at the Central Library. Well, it's nice to see you all here, and uh, Buell and I are going to kick around a few ideas and a few memories, and uh, I don't know how many of you were here in this area in 1960 but uh, Dallas was a rather festering situation. There were arch conservatives who hated Kennedy. They ran a big ad in the Dallas News that morning. They had several functions uh, during that time period, uh, the month before. And there was some fear that, that Mr. Kennedy might, shouldn't come. In fact, John Connolly, who was governor, warned him. Uh, Adlai Stevenson warned him because Stevenson had been attacked about a month before. But the Democratic Party needed to pull their ranks together, the liberals and the conservatives, and if they were going to, to win in 64. So the Kennedys figured they, they really sort of had to come to Texas because they hadn't done that well in the last election in Texas. But it, uh, it, was, it was tenuous. A lot of us thought that there would be something embarrassing done because there were, there were groups that were predicting they were, they were gonna dress up in Uncle Sam suits, they were gonna have signs and placards, and there was just a, a hate Kennedy mood and this wasn't the whole city. This was, a, this was a small cadre, but a very vocal cadre. And uh, I wasn't assigned to the, the story at all, and I felt a little left out because I covered space flight and aviation and things like that, and uh, they just didn't need me on that beat. So that morning I felt a little left out, but I decided to walk over anyway because you don't see a president every day, of course. So I walked over and I wasn't there too many minutes when the motorcade came down Maine and it was it was vibrant, it was exciting. It it was it was really warm. They got the finest ovation, the finest reception that you could imagine, and it was almost over as they turned, made that left turn to go out to the trademark. And then suddenly, three shots. Boom, boom, boom. Nobody knew where they came from. Nobody, the configuration there, of course, there were buildings on two sides, open area on two sides. You couldn't tell where the shots were coming from. You didn't know who was shooting. You didn't know how many were shooting. It was, it was a really scary and chaotic situation. And I remember I didn't have anything to write on, so I, uh, I reached in my pocket and got a couple of envelopes, my gas bill and my electric bill. And then I didn't have a pencil to write with, so I took a pencil from a little boy and gave him a couple of quarters and <laughs> ran off. <laughs> it's, and his daddy was looking pretty mean at me. I, I was lucky to get out of their area. And I started interviewing people and still nobody knew. There was all kind of rumors. Lyndon Johnson had been hit, they said, and that's because a Secret Service man jumped on him and protected him, and they thought he was hit. 
and there were all kinds of, of you know people going in all directions you didn't know where to go I probably would have run had I known where to run but then suddenly it sort of kicked in I I am a reporter don't have a pencil on paper but I'm a reporter I've got to start talking to people so I did and then soon not too long I know that you always, as a reporter in those days, now today's different. We've all got the, all the phones, we've got the equipment of all kinds. But in those days, the only way to know what was going on was get close to a police radio. So I heard this call come in from Oak Cliff where the officer had been shot. And I don't know what made me think this, but I thought if the president is shot, it shot at at least we didn't know then and a police officer is killed three or four miles away it's got to be connected so I grabbed a couple of Channel 8 people I didn't have a car over there but uh, I got in a unit uh, Channel 8 with two guys and we rushed like mad over to Oak Cliff they interviewed all the people that were there and then they didn't know where he went the guy that shot the cop. So then, once again, I get to a police radio and I hear that they've got someone suspect in the Texas theater. So I hadn't eaten breakfast, I drank too much coffee, but I had to run and I was hungry. But I ran up to the Texas theater, got in there just a little bit before they, they grabbed him. and. Uh, that was, that was strange because there's one of the strangest things I saw, as they took him out of there, one of the police officers kept putting a hat over his face, and I wondered why, why that was, you know? When you shoot a cop, you don't really get that much privacy generally. <laughs> but it, uh, the, the whole city was in chaos because they were taking tremendous blame in the whole area, Irving too, and Buell will tell you about the Irving connection here in just a minute. But uh, it was it was just, and two days later, of course, you know what happened, they, they kill Oswald. And that was just stupidity to move him at an announced time. But there again, they had heard all the commentaries from the national television saying, this is Lee Harvey Oswald, this is how he looked at least before the Dallas police got him. Well, that made the city manager and the, the fathers of Dallas insist that they move him and announce the time. And you know what happened there. But I'll, I'll stop now because we're going to have a lot of questions, I think. And I want to introduce Buell, who I've got to know. He's a good friend and he's one of the most honest people I've ever met. And I want to hear what he has to say too. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Let's start with that morning, November the 22nd, 1963. Uh, how was that morning different than any other morning? Uh, really, it wasn't. What was very unusual was that Lee had came, Lee, uh, on his own, he decided to come down to the house where I live with my sister and, and brother-in-law and three children. And I was eating uh, breakfast and my mother was there uh, and she looked up and there was a man looking in the window uh, where the kitchen sink is in the house. And my mother says, it's Starless. She said, who is that? And I looked up and I said, oh, that's Lee. Uh, that's the guy that will be riding to work with me today. So he, after noticing, looking in, and, and he knew that we had seen him, he come around to the back door there, coming into the uh, uh, kitchen and the uh, dining room there. And I told him, I said, I'm running a few minutes later. I said, I'll be out there in just a few minutes. And so I grabbed my lunch and we walked out to the car. Now Lee had already been out to the car uh, because he had put a package on the back seat. My, my late sister, Lenny Mae Fraser Randall, uh, she passed away this past December, on uh, December the 20th. Uh, she had seen him uh, carrying a package. 
And uh, but she didn't say anything to me about it. So when we were getting in the car and I was sitting down, I glanced over my shoulder and I saw this package on the back seat. And I asked Lee, I said, what's in the package? He says, curtain rods. He said, don't you remember? We talked about that yesterday. So I said, yes, I do remember. And I never thought anything else about it. And we, um, we left and uh, he and I rode together to um, work. I'd been having trouble with my old car. There was a couple of guys that had cars. One of them was a guy called Kenny Thompson, who I worked with, and then also the guy that I know that most of you would recognize his name, if not his picture, is Billy Lovelady. And so we used to help one another. Whichever car started is the one we used to go home. <laughs> and. Uh, if Billy's car wouldn't start, well, I'd take him home, and his wife was a fantastic cook. She always had plenty enough for a young, hungry boy. When you're 19 years old, you're always hungry. Uh, so uh, getting back to that day, we, um, we got into work, and I was sitting there, and I was trying to charge my battery, hoping I'd put enough juice in it that it'd start. Well, Lee first got out of the car, and he stood there for a minute, and then he saw what I was doing, and he says, I'm gonna go ahead. Well, he turned around and got the package and walked on. Well, we had to walk from the parking lot where we parked our car, employees like myself. Uh, it, was, it was a good 200 yards, 200 meters or more. And what we had to do, we had to walk from the state warehouse up to the Texas school books there on uh, Elma Houston, and in between these two warehouses, for some of you that lived in this area, you might remember it was a big rail switching yard there. That's where they put a lot of trains. <coughs> so I always watched the trains as I'd walk along the tracks. And by the time we got close to the uh, Texas school, but well, Lee was quite a bit of ways in front of me. Uh, and I didn't think anything about that because I looked at my watch. I still had plenty of time, time to get in there before we started work and not be late. And then when I got inside the warehouse there off the dock, he was nowhere to be found. Uh, I don't know. People might say, well, where did he go? I, I really don't know where he. Did you see him that morning at all? Yes, I did. Now, I did see Lee during the morning, off and on. And I know we had been there for a while. And a lot of the guys, there's one guy named Junior Jarman. He always bought a paper on the way to work. And in the paper there showed the parade route that the presidential parade was going to be coming right by uh, Texas School Books there on uh, Houston and Elm. And so we just went ahead working and then about around noontime, around 12, we all uh, stopped working, whatever we was working on orders, and we went outside and to get ready to watch the parade. Now remember when the parade turned off of uh, Houston Street onto Elm? And I had seen pictures of Jackie Kennedy and the president when they were somewhere else. Not in Texas, but and I I made a remark to myself and to a lady I think by the name of Sarah that was standing beside me. I said, "Look, isn't she beautiful? She looks just like the picture in the magazine." And it was really hard for me because I was saying, and now I know how fortunate I was to be able to witness that. It was really remarkable. And, uh, but Buell, you ran into a little bit of difficulty later in the day when yes, the police I did. took you and questioned you pretty harshly. Yes, they did. Uh, matter of fact, uh, after the president was assassinated and the people began to come back into the building and go to their different workstations where they, where they was working for our publishers in the publisher's office or down in the warehouse where we were, uh, went back to work, 
we started and then we were told that they was having a roll call outside Mr. Truly's office on the first floor. And so we all appeared and they went through a roll call there and everybody was present except Lee. Well, was I, I shocked with that? No, because there was, a, uh, there was some uh, sandwich shops not too far away. And I remember him not taking his lunch that day. He always used to carry, carry his lunch. And I noticed he didn't have his lunch that morning when we left work. He said, well, I'm gonna buy it. So I didn't think anything about it because I had uh, I walked down to a couple of sandwich shops on different occasions myself. And so he went back from lunch. And so I didn't think anything about it. And they went ahead and dismissed us and let us go home. Well, I looked at my watch and on the way home and I looked at it and I said, well, my stepfather was along with my mother. She was up, they were up visiting my sister. And he was in the hospital at um, Irving Boulevard in Pioneers. It's Pine, Pioneer, was it Pioneer Medical Center then? Is that what it's called? Anyways, the hospital there. And so I stopped by there to see him. I got noticed that, uh, that I had a call. And so I told the lady, answered the phone, she said, I got a call for you at the front desk. I said, well, just pass it through. I said, I'm here doing something, helping the nurse. And she says, well, I'm new. I, I really don't know how to do that. And she says, you need to come to the nurse's station. I said, fine. And so I opened the door to go to the uh, nurse's station, and that's when I was met very quickly with two um, detectives. One was named uh, Detective uh, Rose, and the other one was Stovall. And they quickly put me up against the wall very quick. And it really shocked me because I didn't have any idea what was going on. I said, what is going on here? I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're arresting you. I said, arrest me for what? They said, we're taking you downtown and arrest you in reference to the uh, death of John F. Kennedy. I told him, I said, I don't know anything about that. I wouldn't do a thing like that. So they were going to put the cuffs on me. And I told the guy, I said, don't put the cuffs on me. I said, I don't have anything. I'm not guilty of anything. I said, why should I run? I said, we'll just go down and get this straight. And I said, I'll be on my way. Well, we left the um, hospital there, and then we stopped by the uh, Irving Police Department. And they talked to some sergeant there for a while, and then we went on downtown to the police station there on Harwood. That's where it was, right? Harwood. And uh, I was there quite lengthy. Uh, it started off long sessions with Detective Rose and Stovall. Uh, some people might say, interviewing me it was uh, it was more than an interview I could I had to look straight ahead into a wall and I couldn't look sideways and they asked the same questions different ways over and over and over well they quit they would quit and then another team would come in and the same question <coughs> over and over and over for hours Captain Fritz got it in your face, actually, didn't he? Yes. Uh, Captain Fritz. Uh, I met Captain Fritz that night, November the 22nd. Never had seen or heard of the man. Didn't know anything about him. He's a little short man. Uh, red face. Uh, Captain Will Fritz, I'm sure, in all the time he worked for the Dallas Police Department, I'm sure he did a lot of good things for them. But the way he treated me was totally uncalled for because I had never been in any type of trouble of any type. So he come in and when he came into the room where I was, he had a piece of paper, standard size typing paper. And he gave me a pen and he said, sign this. Well, I started to read that. And he wanted me to confess to being part of the JFK assassination. I told him, I said, I'm not going to sign it. I said, this is ridiculous. Well, he drew his hand back to hit me. And I did my arm up like this, because he was like over here where Mr. Ainsworth is. And blocked. 
and I told him, I says, you know, there's some policemen out, uh, outside that door there, but I said, before they get in there, I said, we're going to have one hell of a fight. And I said, I'm going to get some licks in on you. I said, I'm not signing that. Well, then he reached over and snatched it up, kind of wadding it up as he snatched it up, and stomped out of the room. And I never did see the man anymore after that. Um, How many hours did they actually hold you? Well, they picked me up early afternoon, and they let, started to let me go home around 9 o'clock, a little after 9 o'clock. Uh, and then they got a call, and they brought me back to the station, and then when they brought me back, uh, same two detectives, Rose and Stovall, and my sister was with me, by the way. Then that's where they fingerprinted me and did the, the routine mug shot, the whole routine. And uh, I went through some more questioning. Uh, time, time I got out of there and got home, it was the early hours of Saturday morning. Um, it's, a, it's an ordeal I've never forgotten. Um, well, and then later on, when you went before the Warren Commission, they sort of gave you a tough time too, didn't they? Yes, they did. Explain that to us, if you will. Okay. Um, my sister and I, we went, as I said, my sister, Miss Lady May Fraser Randall, uh, they uh, arranged for us to come to Washington, D.C. to testify before the Warren Commission. And we both testified. And and during, the test, during my testimony, they would ask me things, and they would try to get me to change my testimony to what they wanted. And when I would not do this, now here's, here's the catcher. Listen to this real well. They said, oh, he doesn't know. He's just mistaken. Well, that to me, it just said, you just soon to punch me in the face, because I've never forgotten that. And I read some of their comments. How can someone that wasn't even there know all the answers? I don't know all the answers, and I don't know anybody does. But when someone, you testify before somebody and you tell them the truth, and they don't like your answer, oh, he's mistaken, he just doesn't know. But they were trying to get you to explain why you didn't notice the gun in the back of the car. Because there was no gun. That's what they wouldn't buy. The police department here in Dallas didn't do it, and neither did they. And while we were there testifying before the Warren Commission, my sister and I both had to make bags, what we saw that day, for only just a glance from our memory. We, had, we didn't have a, all the thing we had was uh, a pair of scissors and tape and paper. And we had to make, I can't tell you how many bags I made. And what they couldn't understand, how they could come so close to what I said. It was entirely different than what they wanted me to say. I'll be quite frank with you, I don't know how the rifle got in the building, and I don't think they do either. Because if they did, they wouldn't be asking me. They'd already know. But then again, they might ask me to see what I tell them. I would tell them. Um, so I really didn't think too much about going up to Washington and testifying before the Warren Commission. I will say this, uh, a congressman by the name of uh, Gerald Ford, uh, he came by and he spent some time with my sister and I during our short lunch break there while we were testifying in the Warren Commission. And I don't know whether you're Republican or Democrat. That doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, Mr. Ford showed us the courtesy that I, that I thought was very, very well. He did very well. The thing that was so shocking, our own now was then president, 
our vice president, Lyndon Bain Johnson, he never gave you one minute of his time. And I often ask myself, I know the President of the United States and the Vice President are very busy, they have a lot of things to do, but in something so important, why couldn't he take just a few minutes and come by and see how my sister and I was doing? That's the first time we'd ever been to Washington, that's the first time we'd ever been on an aircraft, and you're surrounded by people you don't know. And I'll tell you what one thing I got out of this, and I'll always carry it with me. I have a hard time trusting people today. Because before this happened, I grew up in a small town where everybody knew everybody and, and you were friends and everybody was your friend and you knew what they were thinking. But then the thing that I uh, moved to Dallas, moved to Irving and worked in Dallas and then this tragedy happened and the things that I encountered, I will never forget. Well, Buell, I think that these people will want to know about your relationship with Lee. What did you talk about? What kind of guy was he? I'm sure they're interested in that. Uh, that's a good question, Mr. Ainsworth. Um, uh, Lee was a very quiet person. He was very dedicated in whatever he was doing. Uh, he was a quick learner. He was very smart. Uh, I know some people say, well, if you're filling, if you're an order filler, you don't have to, you don't have to be the, the sharpest knife in town. Well, I've got news for you. When you're, when you're dealing with hundreds of titles, and at that time, we, we covered a five state area. It was New Mexico, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas and Louisiana, public schools as well as colleges. We had every type of textbook there that you could think of. Well, it was people that worked there in the warehouse, but everybody couldn't be an order filler because it was just too much to grasp. You had to be a quick learner and, and you had to uh, get things right. Mr. Shelley was a great uh, boss, but I mean, he run a tight ship. Uh, he didn't want a lot of arrows. And you had a lot of orders to fill every day. Uh, Lee was a, a type of man that he wasn't a big talker. Uh, he wouldn't initiate a conversation, but if you'd asked him something, uh, he would tell you. He would answer you. And I know on several occasions that he, he tried to uh, eat his lunch in the break room where the guys um, played cars and dominoes. And well, he tried to mix in with them, but uh, that didn't go too well. And the reason why was because if, let's just take any one of you and myself and Lee, we had witnessed something that had happened, say like out there on the street, on Houston Street, going by Texas School Bucks. And if we was to eat, sat down and tell the group actually what went on out there, so like it was an accident or something. Well, they would be able to understand you probably and relate to what you were saying, and myself. But then when Lee would tell it, uh, Lee told it, he was telling the truth, but the, the words he would use to describe what actually happened. Uh, and then naturally they didn't understand some of the vocabulary he used, so therefore they would kind of make fun of him. He was the joke of the day. But he never was a joke to me because he was a lot of help to me. Did he ever discuss politics or Mr. Kennedy or anything? No. Uh, one time when we was going home from work, he asked me, he says, uh, he said, do you follow politics? I said, no. I said, I'm not interested in politics. And I said, you probably wonder why. I said, well, you know, people are politicians. I said, you can't trust them. Because I said, they'll lie to you. And I said, I don't, I don't want any part of that, that uh, business. I said, my, uh, my life and, and what I'm doing is more important than trying to figure out where a politician is telling me the truth or not. I said, I don't give them the time of day. And that was all we ever talked about. Uh, now, back and forth on our rides, 
out on Friday. You know, we talk about the traffic, the weather, just general things, nothing. Talked about his kids a lot, didn't you? Yes, he did. Now, the thing is, if I wanted to get, get him to talk it, I would ask him, I said, well, are you looking forward to playing uh, C. Marina? They had one child, and she was pregnant with a second one. And uh, I think the second one was born right before the assassination, right was before. it not? That I didn't know until later. Uh, but I knew he had the one child, and uh, and he would he would chuckle, and he would think about something, and he would tell you something funny that they had done together, something they had shared. But Lee was a type of man that my three little nieces uh, used to go down the street about half a block, and there was a big oak tree there, and he used to play with the kids in the neighborhood, and I used to hear my little nieces talk about Lee that they thought he was a nice man and he was kind. And, uh, and I know that a lot of publications you read about Lee Oswald, you probably never heard that line, that he played with children and he was very kind. But he was. Uh, I sometimes I think about Lee. Uh, what he'd be like today, uh, uh, how how he would uh, adjust to what's going on in the last 50 years. Um, but we'll never know that because we know all what happened on Sunday morning when Jack Rubenstein, also known as Jack Ruby, um, in the basement of the uh, police building, walked up and shot Lee and and Lee died a short time later over at Parkland Hospital. Uh, well, Buell, I guess people might be tired of hearing you and me. Let's take a few questions. Sure. The package in the back. We all assume it's assassination right there. If that wasn't in your back seat, uh, I think it's, I'm a little unsure. How did he get there? I mean, what was he putting in that back seat? It wasn't curtain rods, so what was it? I mean, can can you help us with that? What it could have been? Yes. Uh, the first thing, no one knows what was in that bag but Lee. The second thing, if it wasn't the rifle in the bag, which we know it cannot be because if he was to take the Italian uh, Concarno rifle and take the barrel off of the stock, it would not fit in that bag that I described. And so, therefore, the next question, how did it get into the Texas School Book Depository? That's a very good question. I don't have a clue, and a lot of other people I don't think know either. Somebody probably knows, but nobody's going to tell you that. Is it possible that just the fact that you glanced over your right shoulder didn't really give you enough perspective to place the right length on that package? I know it would be an honest mistake on your part. Is that possible? Well, I can understand your question there, but the thing is, again, the way he carried the package after he left the car, you would have seen the barrel sticking up above his shoulder. Mr. Ainsworth and I, we, we both uh, worked for uh, History of America tours for what it was about three years. Uh, and one of the people that was on the panel with us is also another writer by the name of Josiah Thompson. Uh, he some way found a Titan Concardo rifle and he brought it to the uh, uh, meeting where we were meeting there with the people that had signed up for the uh, History of America tour, the JFK tour. And there's no way taking the barrel off of the stock. You could put it in a, a bag 24 to 26 inches long. 
there's no way you could. Yeah, um, you've answered, you know, as far as the size of it and everything, and like you said, you didn't just see it over your shoulder, you saw him leave the car with it and everything, correct? But the man back there said something I have never heard before. Did they really say, is that legitimate, that there was no need for the curtain rods at the house in, uh, where he lived in Dallas? Okay, I'm glad you, you brought that up. What I found out, and that I did not know at that time, that the uh, room that he rented on Beckley there, it already had curtains in the room. Mm -hmm. Since I had never been there, I've never been in the Proven House even today, I would not know that. I was there that afternoon, and there were very nice curtain rods. <clears throat> there was no need for curtain rods. So, get into what the three of the three questions answered so far, and I've told you there's no way that that rifle, you could break it down, it'd fit in that bag. So, what some people think Excuse me. is that I'm lying about it, but I'm not. My eyesight was 20-20 then, it's 20-20 now with glasses on. And I guarantee you, from a boy growing up in the country that used to hunt, I would know a rifle when I saw one. Right here? In the, uh, in the bag that they found, was there fluid in the bag that matched the rifle or something similar to it? Now that I don't know. Now I've heard that, but I don't know that for sure. Now I know the bag that they presumably found had, you know, like where well, you would all a rifle and things like that. I've heard that, but I've never seen that bag. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, Lee and his typical work assignments, uh, would it be unusual for one of the workers to uh, be able to, in effect, steal away and set himself up uh, where Lee did and uh, no one would know that he was there? Okay, that's, that's a good question. That's possible, but see on that morning, that Friday morning, they were working on the uh, sixth floor. Uh, a number of guys that were working, and they were putting down, I think it was half inch or three quarter inch plywood, because the old floor they was, thought was getting weak. If you look in these old warehouses, uh, that's down there in that area, the, the beams that run through the building, they're huge like this. And they got big posts ever so far. Uh, and they were working there on the sixth floor. I didn't see Lee much that day on, on, the, uh, on November the 22nd that morning. I did not see him. Uh, by being uh, an order filler, I taught or I tried to teach Lee everything I knew. I could go from the basement to the seventh floor. Now the second, third, and fourth floor uh, were offices. The fourth floor was a partial office, and the rest of that was warehouse. And according to the publication that's on the order, I would go anywhere to get those. And so Lee could move around pretty freely. And see him on one floor now, and. 30 minutes later, see him somewhere else is nothing unusual. But, uh, so he wouldn't be missed if he walked over this way or no. not to another floor? No. See, because going up on the different floors, you could use <clears throat> two freight elevators there, uh, right close to the loading dock that uh, he walked up on that morning. We always walked up. There was two uh, freight elevators, and then uh, over close to where Billy Lovelady used to ride up the freight bills, there was a staircase. You go up the stairs to different floors. Well, logistics aside, you do believe that Lee Harvey Oswald fired out that window, don't you? Well, I've been told that, and the <laughs> ballistics the ballistics show that the rifle that they found, the rounds were fired out of that rifle. Why'd they kick you out of the guy that must have done it? 
Well, that's a good question. How, 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 would they, how would they make me a suspect? Well, I guess because he and I spent a lot of time because we wouldn't always write together, but when we first started, he was just like a shadow. I guess because I spent so much time with him, teaching him how to fill uh, different publishers. How about over here? If Kennedy was shot at 1230, and uh, pronounced dead at 1.30, and Mr. Ainsworth, you said that you went to Oak Cliff, you know, and when uh, Lee was apprehended at Texas Theater right around 2 o'clock. How did they make the connection in Irving, you know, because my wife went to school with Diana, your niece, uh -huh. and she said that when she got out of school at 2.30, FBI, CIA, someone, government people were already in Irving, you know, questioning your family. Yeah. How did they make that connection that fast if Mr. Ainsworth was at Oak Cliff? How did they make that urban connection that fast? Now that, I don't know. I wish our friend Jim Lavelle was here because Jim Lavelle, as you well know, was the uh, a policeman that, uh, detective that Lee was handcuffed to that morning that Jack Ruby uh, shot, and shot him in the basement there. Uh, Jim Lavelle might be able to answer that. That I don't know. Do you have any ideas? I, I don't really know. Uh, I, I know that the uh, there were several news media reporting everything that, that went on, including the police officer shot and the capture in the theater. And but I don't know how they got there that fast either. Well, you know, it just makes me wonder. You know, maybe he was set up. You know, a CIA, you know, connection or something. But I'm just wondering, people that questioned you at the hospital when you went to visit your father-in-law, uh, were they Irving detectives, uh, FBI, CIA? Uh, the two men that arrested me there at the Pioneer Medical Center was Detective Rose and Detective Stovall, and they was out of the Dallas Police Department. Once again, how did they make that connection to Irving that fast when they were going to Oak Cliff to apprehend the supposed you know, killer of JFK? How they make that Irving connection that fast is what, you know, makes me think. I, I would imagine that uh, they checked with Roy Truly at the depository and found out that he was missing and got where his address... Yeah, but his address was Beckley, wasn't it? That is true. I, I don't know. How did they know that you were visiting your father-in-law at the, at the hospital or clinic? Well, it's not my father, it's my stepfather, okay? Uh, the way they found that out is that they had um, they had come out to my sister's house and they asked, well, where is he? Because they had been there and searched the house and, and I had a, a British Enfield 303 rifle and they took that for the ammo and I had a, uh, a 16 gauge double barrel shotgun and they took that. And they kept that for quite a long time before I ever got that back. Uh, why they took the shotgun, I don't know. Uh, I really don't understand about the rifle I had. But I guess they were just doing their job. When you left work that day, Mr. Frazier, did you wonder why he wasn't riding home with you? Well, I asked him on Thursday when he wanted to go out. I said, will you be going home with me on Friday? He said, no. And, but when I left work on that Friday, November the 22nd, 1963, one of the things that Lee and I did a lot of times, we listened to the radio. I turned the radio on going home, and that's when I learned that they had someone cornered out in Texas Theater, out in Oak Cliff, and later they made arrest. They arrested the individual, and they said the man uh, they didn't give his name. They said that he had he had been to Russia. Well, I knew Lee had been to Russia, but we never talked about that. The way I found out about that, I think, was from my sister. And she told me that Lee had uh, gone to Russia, and that's where he married uh, and met uh, Marina. And they were married, and then he came back to the uh, uh, to the United States. But as far as uh, knowing that 
that was Lee that they arrested at that time? No, I did not. When Lee Harvey Oswald left the Texas School Book Depository, yes. left his weapon there, where did he acquire the pistol that he killed that Officer J.D. Really Tempest nice. with? He, he rode a bus for a little ways, then he got in the cab. Cab took him over close to his uh, rooming house on Beckley. He went in there, changed his jacket, got the, the pistol. How long did you know him prior to the 22nd? How long did he work there? Did you know him from the neighborhood before that? Okay, the first day that I actually met Lee Oswald was the first day he reported for work, which was outside of Mr. Shelley and Mr. Truly's office. They called me over there and introduced me to Lee. Uh, I did not know Lee before that. I know you may read things that I knew Lee before that day, his first day at work, and that is totally false. I met Lee there that morning. Mr. Shelley introduced him to me and said, this is Lee, and he's going to be working with us, and I want you to teach him everything you know about filling these orders. Now, that was just four or five weeks before, was it? Yes. It was a short time. And, and also, when... We would ride out on Friday afternoon to Irving to see his wife at Miss Payne's house. We never did anything together. We never stopped anywhere. We never went to the movies. We never went for a beer or anything. It was just straight from work out to the Payne's house. I dropped him off, and I never did see him until Monday morning. What he did, who he talked to, uh, what he was involved in, I, I had no idea. How many people were working in the school depository building? And how many of those folks were Irving residents? Do you know that? No, sir, I do not know how many people worked there because you would have to take in consideration the people that worked in the publisher's offices as well as the people that worked in the warehouse. Uh, I have never heard anyone say the exact number. And far as anyone living out in Irving, Mr. Shelley lived in, um, I think, Dallas, and he moved to Irving after that happened. But uh, I worked with a man after this happened. He lived, he lived in Irving for a short time. But during this time we're talking about, November the 22nd, 1963, the only body I knew lived in Irving that actually worked there was myself and then Lee would ride in with me on Monday morning from visiting with his family at the Payne house. And I'm just curious as if he rode to Irving with anyone else or, uh, you know, if there was any other people out there that he might have associated with. Well, that, I don't know. Now, like I said, when I told you he'd ride out with me on Friday afternoon, what he did between Friday afternoon and Monday morning, I don't know. But you remember he only spent, what, eight or ten days in Irving, total. Well, he spent Friday afternoon to Monday morning, and he did that, I don't know how many weeks there. Yeah. Uh, and he went, to, he went out to Irving with me every Friday except one. And I asked him why he was going, and he told me that he was practicing uh, obtaining his driving license and he's gonna go practice taking his driving test that if he did that I don't know uh, if he did that or not I really I, I don't have any idea here thank you, thank you. okay one thing and I know this was in the movie and I know a lot of that was made up but I'm just curious if anything similar to this took place they said that Mr. Truly, the manager of the building, brought one of the policemen in there. They were running like crazy in the building looking for people and because they knew a shot had come from there. And Mr. Truly, they found Oswald sitting in the luxury by himself, drinking a Coke, very relaxed. And Mr. Truly told Oswald, the president's been shot. And they made a big deal out of how relaxed Lee was. Do you know if anything that, like that really took place? Well, um, I don't think he was sitting. He was... They stopped him in front of the door, didn't they? He was in the lunchroom there. Yeah, I, all I remember, he was uh, in the lunchroom. He might have been standing, but he wasn't rushing. He wasn't out of breath or anything, you know what I mean? So, you now, think something like that similar dislike takes place, maybe? 
that may have been one of the most, one of the few things that were actually true in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> when did you realize that the president was shot? When did I realize the president? Yes. Well, shortly after the third shot. Oh, if you, so you heard it? Yes, I heard the shots. Oh, okay. I was standing on the uh, back in the shadows of there. When you walk into like uh, the Texas School Book building today, uh, you walk up and there's a space there. And I was standing there watching the parade back in the shadows. You can't see me, but I was there. Uh, after the third shot, it was really mayhem there at Dealey Plaza. People was running, hollering, screaming. And a lady, I had walked down and was standing right there in front of the first step. And a lady come by and she was crying because she had been down the sidewalk somewhere down toward the uh, triple underpass, and she come by and she said, they have shot the president. And so, <coughs> Sarah, the lady I was standing by, up on the top, stepped back in the shadows. We looked at one another, and we really didn't have a lot to say. We just listened to what the lady told us. And we stayed down there a little, a little while, right there at the entrance. And then, people began to come back in, uh, go back to work. But before that, the, the policemen, there were a lot of policemen around there very quickly. And some of them already had their, their pistols out of their holsters. So I said to myself, I said, just stay still. <laughs> How much longer did you work at the school depository after this incident? And what have you been doing the last 50 years? <laughs> You really wouldn't want to know. <laughs> uh, I worked. I worked. I stayed there and I worked at the school de book depository. I left there the um, the end of July. I think. The, uh, and from there, I went into the army for a while. You know, I got one of those nice letters. Fair <laughs> <laughs> enough. Sure uh, the people in your community. Had volunteered you. <laughs> you spent about 20 minutes in the car on your way to work that morning, I guess, about that much time. What was this guy, if you believe the Warren Commission was about to shoot the president, what was his demeanor like? Was the radio on in the car? Did he seem nervous looking back at it, at the situation? What, what You're talking about the morning of November the 22nd? Yes. Um, he was just like, he was. Just a typical old self. Uh, like I said, the only thing different about that was was that he had um, walked down to my sister's house. Usually, I would pick him up. He'd be coming down the sidewalk. The only reason he got there and put the package in the back seat was because I was running late. I should have already been through eating my breakfast would have probably caught him coming down the sidewalk like I did a lot of times. Do you recall any conversation in the car on the way to work or was it just silence? Um, we listened to the news and the music and, and I, I made a comment I said well this is this is nasty I said I wish it either rain or stop this little old mist <laughs> you know I said all it does is just mess up the windshield. Did you bring him to Irving the night before the assassination? I did. Yes, yes he, uh, on that Thursday, the 21st, uh, he had approached me uh, down on the first floor there where we used to bring a lot of the orders, uh, the freight orders. Uh, he asked me, he says, can I ride home with you this afternoon? I said, sure. And then a little while later it dawned on me, I said, this is not Friday. It's Thursday. Well, when I ran into him a few minutes later, 20, 30 minutes later, whatever the time was, I said, what do you want to go home today for? I said, today's Thursday. I said, you don't ever go to Friday. And then that's when he told me the story that he's going home to get the curtain rods to put up the curtains in his apartment or in his rooming house or that room he, he was renting. By never going out there, I didn't know that. Um, I know sometimes the... Um, the people has questioned me in the police department and uh, warned me they think that's kind of <laughs> odd. I didn't know about what was in his room and 
you know, his room. Uh, I don't know where they come up with that, but they did. And I, I answered them to the best of my ability. Uh, since then, I have been out to the house there on Beckley with my good friend Dave Perry, but I've never been inside. <laughs> so I couldn't, I couldn't tell you even what it looks like on the inside. What was going through your mind when you started reading the piece of paper that the police handed you wanting you to confess to killing Kennedy? Well, I'd been through a marathon uh, questioning, but that's like somebody just punched you right square in the face. I said, this is ludicrous. This is nuts. I said, I'm not signing this. And then that's when <clears throat> Captain Will Fritz was going to strike me. But that never happened because I put my arm up and blocked him. Uh, Why he would do something like it, I don't know. I can't answer that. He's not here, so he can't answer that. So I guess, I guess maybe he thought that they could pressure me into something. But the thing he wasn't aware of was that my stepfather was a tyrant. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, you were used to that. <laughs> yes. He was, um, he was a very hard worker, he's a workaholic, and he was also an alcoholic. And I knew, I could tell, when I'd see him coming, I could tell, before he even got close to me, I could tell by the, his complexion and the way he walked if he'd been drinking. And if he'd been drinking, you know, sometimes people, when they drink, uh, they become happy. And some become angry and mean, while he was the latter. So I knew to stay away from him. Uh, and then when I got in the military, and they gave me some of those chores that would make a decent person go nuts, they didn't bother me. Drill started to be hollering and screaming in your face at far. They couldn't intimidate me because I'd already been intimidated so, so many years of my life. <laughs> so I guess, in a way, I, I ask myself sometimes, maybe living in the house with him maybe prepared me for this. And maybe that's why I could, I could stand up to Captain Will Fritz. Because I wasn't going to admit to do anything. I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do anything like that in my wildest dreams. Because first thing, it's wrong. I don't care whether you, you like the person or not. If a person holds public office, they should be able to run for public office and serve there. You may not dis I like it. You may disagree with them on some things, and you may not like them. But as far as killing someone, that doesn't that doesn't sit well with me. We enjoyed very much being with you, and you asked some good questions. Enjoyed being with you.